So we'll wait for a few minutes and then yes. start. Huh? Sure. So sure. Just six o'clock now. Yes. We need to give grace time for people. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, two minutes culture in our recording start. Uh, so six zero five we can start the thing. Good evening, folks. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. How are you, sir? How's everything? Uh, good, sir. Everything's fine, sir. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. So we have another scintillating, highly technical session ahead. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, this uh, contextual talk. And it's a very, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a conceptual talk. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. And I think globally, everyone is uh, uh, thrilled, you know, that I Tesla... See. The way Tesla has uh, gone ahead. Oh, it really the, the first automobile company crossing one uh, one trillion dollar. Absolutely right. And the, the next is truly the Rivian, supported by Amazon. Yes. Not even, not even production started, but already yes. the valuation is hundred billion dollars. Yes, yes. <laughs> what a crazy valuations? Crazy. So, uh, yeah, Tesla has uh, superseded uh, the hundred plus year old uh, companies. You know, all so, of them so, combined together. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> both Toyota and GM. <laughs> so it's an uh, unparalleled growth, you know, something. It's unparalleled, yeah, yeah. Something like Nike here, yeah. yeah Nike. And see that today's latent analytics, 326 times, highest uh, number of times subscribed. 600 crores, 600 crores, 1.1 lakh crore rupees. Yes, yes 1.13 or something okay. like that. So it is the, as of today, that is the highest uh, IPO, you know, highest time uh, over subscribe. But that's the future now, data analytics, yes. AI. He's talking all about futuristic technologies. Yes, yes. But the pricing, they have made it very, very affordable. You know, that is yeah, yeah. Different. The pricing has been really good. Nike was very steep. Yeah, but uh, it has started almost 100% uh, premium, uh, no? Absolutely right. And okay. cross that also. Mm. There's heavy buying yesterday, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any of this, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Recording, right? Okay. So, I think we can start now. Ram, Ram, so are you ready? We'll start now. Sure, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening to one and all. On behalf of IEEE Computer Society, ACM, and CSI, I have great pleasure in welcoming the delegates of today's evening program on the uh, contextual topic, the future of mobility, the convergence of electric, connected, and autonomous vehicle. This topic has become global interest topic because of the raising concerns of climate change and related issues. We have two eminent and authoritative speakers on this subject of mobility, Dr. Shankar Venugopal and Mr. Ramachandran, who have been involved in this area for several years. I welcome them 
along with my colleagues from the organizing societies, namely IEEE Computer Society, ACM and Computer Society of India. Automotive industry is facing a lot of changes. Customers are expecting affordable and efficient and connected vehicles with flexibility. Regulatory needs are pushing the industry to reduce its carbon footprint. There are supply chain constraints, starting from the raw materials to the more advanced chips and electronics used in every car today. Digital technologies play a major role in the automotive industry to manage these forces and challenges, and the industry itself is undergoing massive digital transformation. The automotive industry's answer to these challenges is the convergence of electric, connected, and autonomous vehicles backed by new business models. Today's session will start with the big picture of the automotive industry and then do a deep dive into electrification, connectivity, and autonomous driving. Countries and vehicle makers have set a deadline to stop making engine-driven vehicles and shift to electric vehicles. By 2030, electronic components are predicted to reach half of the cost of the car. Connectivity will be a basic feature expected in every car with the value of data realized in the form of businesses like usage-based insurance, etc. It may be interesting to note the number of lines of code in a car, which was about 10 million in 2010, has grown to 150 million lines in 2016, and it is still growing. With so many sweeping changes are happening, this session is going to give a bird's eye view for students, early and mid-career professionals, and where there are opportunities to develop your career and upskill yourself. I have great pleasure in formally introducing the speakers. Dr. Shankar Venugopal is currently the Vice President at Mahindra and & Mahindra and leads the technology innovation for the automotive and farm services business. He also heads the intellectual property related to patents and knowledge management functions, along with being the Dean of the Mahindra Technical Academy. Dr. Shankar is passionate about developing sustainable urban mobility solutions and his current interests span across electric vehicles, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and precision farming. Prior to joining Mahindra and Mahindra, Dr. Shankar has held technology innovation leadership roles at GE, Dow Chemicals, Honeywell, and Cummins. He holds 10 international patents and numerous new product innovation awards. He was awarded GE's Edison Inventor Medal early in his career. He has developed a proprietary innovation methodology that is innovation flow and trained over 1,000 inventors and innovators. Dr. Shankar obtained a PhD in material science and he is a gold medal for the best doctoral thesis from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He had completed his executive management program from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Dr. Shankar is an avid reader and is interested in physics, philosophy, and psychology. He teaches technology innovation and management at premier engineering and management institutes in India and abroad. Dr. Shankar was recognized as one of the 50 innovative leaders at the world level at the Innovation Congress 2020. He is also a TEDx speaker. Dr. Shankar is very active in the Confederation of Indian Industries, that is uh, known as CII, and leads the CTO Forum, bringing together technology leaders across the industry to share best practices on adopting new technologies and driving innovation. He plays an active role in the management committee of the Society of Automotive Engineers, Southern, Southern India section. He is focused on reskilling automotive engineers and electric mobility. He also serves in the branding and communication committee of SAE India. Welcome, Dr. Shankar. Now I would like to brief about uh, Mr. S. Ramachandran. 
Mr. S. Ramachandran, popularly known as Ram, is not new to our members. He has already addressed us twice. Mr. Ram is a consultant, author, and speaker in the thought leadership team in Infosys Knowledge Institute. He leads the manufacturing and engineering domains. His focus is on the application of emerging technologies for manufacturing systems. He conducts market research and publishes points of views based on recent trends in management and digitization. He is a regular blogger and also a great speaker on topics such as digital transformation, industry 4.0, circular economy, and risk building. Ram has more than 22 years of global corporate experience, starting with Hindustan Motors. He spent a significant part of his career in General Electric, in energy business in the USA and in India, leading digitization projects for e-engineering, PLM, and reliability programs. He was a supply chain transformation manager in Hewlett Packard for a couple of years. Prior to Infosys, he was an analyst in IDC, Manufacturing Insights, wherein his role involved ongoing industry leadership, interaction and collaboration, conducting market research and driving consulting projects. Ram is a mechanical engineer with a master's in production engineering from PhD College of Technology, Bayambatur. He did his executive MBA from IAM Bangalore. He was a research student in the Robotics Research Center at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore for two years. Ram has co-authored a book titled New Skilling for Digital Transformation and the Artificial Intelligence Revolution with Professor L. Prasad of Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, published by Wiley India. This book has become very popular. And in fact, uh, Ram has given a talk on the topic of the book, New Skilling, to our members sometime last year. He is a member of uh, SAE and uh, also represents in the board for branding and communication section. He led the editorial efforts of the Women in STEM 2021, a book brought out by CIA. With this brief introduction of our eminent speakers, now I would like to request Mr. Ram to address the participants first and provide an overview to the topic. His presentation will be followed by Dr. Shankar, who will deal with the subject in detail. Now over to Mr. Ram. Ram, please. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can I share my screen, sir? Yes, sir. They will make it. So I hope all of you can see my screen. Yes. OK, great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to Mr. Mohan and the organizing team for giving us this opportunity to share our thoughts on a very interesting topic. Me and Dr. Shankar continue to work on this uh, topic. So as you can see, the title is Convergence of Connected Electric Autonomous Vehicles. So as all of you know, for a, a auto industry, is a very innovative industry, right? So it is usually an early adopter. It comes out with new materials, new methodologies, new management principles. It's a very happening industry. Within that, we have, uh, all of us know that CASE or Connected uh, Autonomous Shared and Electric Vehicles. That has been promoted for a long time, for the past few years, as a futuristic uh, trend of auto industry, where the auto industry is headed. But as you can see in this presentation, this case trend is no longer futuristic. It is already happening even in countries like India. So that is where uh, when uh, me and Dr. Shankar were thinking of a topic with Mr. Mohan, we came up with this topic. So case, these four trends are no longer separate topics, uh, trends. There is already convergence of these four trends happening. So that's the uh, topic for today's presentation. Like Mr. Mohan said, I will give you a macro perspective on where is the industry headed uh, in this uh, case trend, what is happening in India. And more importantly, we look at why is the auto industry facing this situation? Like Mr. Mohan said initially, the auto industry is facing a lot of uh, you know, pressure to change from all sides. So we'll also look at uh, why this is happening. And as an impact of it, 
employment is getting affected. You need different types of skill sets. Most of you are students and opportunities. But on the flip side, it gives you a lot of opportunities for you. If you pick up the right skill sets, if you understand the big picture and also go into the details, if you have both the perspectives, then you have an amazing career in front of you. So that is that is a key takeaway we want all of you to take away from this. So we will give you the concepts. We will support it with live examples uh, from uh, you know, India itself and also some global examples. So the topic is about how these uh, trends are uh, converging together. You may ask why shared is not here. So shared is sharing vehicles is more of a business model. It is enabled by these technologies like connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, platforms like Uber. So we will touch upon shared also. So there are separate uh, convergences of these individual technologies. All four of them also converge. So I will give the big picture and then Dr. Shankar will do the deep dive. So this is the agenda for uh, my session, the first session. We we'll look at case trend. Most of you should be aware of it, but still we will do a quick recap for those of you who are uh, new to this. But for auto enthusiasts, uh, case is not at all a new terminology. And then we will look at the reasons for transformation. We will take a snapshot of case. Where exactly is case today, specifically in the Indian context and also globally? And then we will see how this is leading to employment changes. This is a big worry for mid-career professionals specifically because uh, some of the technologies where they have spent a lifetime, like internal combustion engine, their design and manufacture, if all of them are going to go away, then employment is going to take a huge hit. But for you, it, it being aware of this is a good opportunity early in your career. So if you plan for it, you can have a, a lifelong a productive career in an area in which you're interested in. So like Mr. Mohan said, me and Professor Prasad have written a book about it. So that's a separate topic. But one point I will insist upon is that we are moving more towards the skill-based uh, industrial world. So just having degrees and courses is not sufficient. They are definitely important. I'm not wishing away the importance of formal education. But make sure that you pick up the right skills. So I'll briefly touch upon what are the hard skills, what are the soft skills that the industry expects. Then I'll briefly touch upon the basic architecture of a, of a modern vehicle when uh, these four trends converge, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Shankar. We'll also have a Q&A, depending on the time. So that's the agenda for this session. So let's start with CASE. So as all of you know, CASE stands for Connected, Autonomous, Shared, and Electric Vehicles. What is CC is Connected Cars. The Internet of Things wave made this very popular. Today, telecom is getting cheaper day by day. Connectivity is becoming cheaper. So connectivity makes a lot of sense for auto industry. So this is the first trend. So a lot of predictions were made. Gartner is an analyst firm. Most of you should be aware of it. Gartner had made some predictions saying a quarter billion connected cars will be there in 2020. One in five new cars sold worldwide will be connected. I think all these uh, forecasts have been blown to the wind. So connected cars has been growing. It is going to become a basic uh, feature in cars. Again, just to give you the Indian context, I think it was last week when Maruti announced their uh, Maruti Connect program. So Maruti, as you know, commands a 50% market share in the Indian market. So who better than Maruti to look at trends on where it is heading? So Maruti Connect provides several features both for customers like you and me and also for the OEM. So for example, for the customer, it provides security fees. First is the location-based service. So you can know where a car is. <coughs> so you can even share your location with others. So a lot of location-based services are provided. And then there is a uh, security part. Uh, let me just drink some water, sorry.
Ram, you are muted. Unmute. unmute, unmute. Yeah, sorry for that. So I was talking about uh, Maruti's connected feature. So today Maruti offers connectivity which are beneficial for customers like you and me. It offers you location tracking of vehicles. It uh, provides security features so that if somebody by mistake tries to access your car, you get an alert. It provides you safety features. And your and presentation is missing. Huh? Can you just sorry. present? You rejoined, but your presentation is missing. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Just I mean, screen is set to come. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So I was talking about connectivity features in Maruti. So Maruti Connect has become a has, is a newly launched program in Maruti today, available for different models. So it provides connectivity features both for consumers like you and me, and also for Maruti. So for us, it offers safety, security, location tracking type of features. For the OEM, Maruti, it offers vehicle information, driver information. So Mr. Mohan spoke about usage-based insurance. So today you can monitor the driving patterns of a particular driver using IoT. So that's how common connectivity is becoming in cars today. Next is autonomous cars. So the moment we talk about autonomous cars, we think of a car without a steering wheel, a fully autonomous car. That we may never reach such a situation. It may happen in industrial scenarios. But uh, again, you'll be surprised to know that there are several models in India which offer basic level one and level two autonomy. So we'll touch upon what are the different levels of autonomy in a, in a car. But Mahindra uh, offers uh, basic uh, autonomy in some of its models. Some premier brands like Mercedes-Benz offer uh, basic autonomy features like parking assist, collision avoidance, uh, alerts when there is a lane change. So those type of basic autonomous features are already available in cars today. Shared service, like I said, it's more of a business model. It makes use of technologies. So shared itself is a convergence, if you ask me, of connected cars and uh, new business models. So again, Maruti, going back to it, uh, Maruti subscribe is an example where you can subscribe to a car for uh, a few years. You pay a monthly fee. If it, it it is a very it is a flat fee, but ideally, if it becomes usage based, then it can make use of connectivity. So this month I'm going to drive to office every day, so I pay X amount. But next week, next month I'm not going to drive much, so why should I pay so much? So it can become usage based also. So there is a lot of opportunity for uh, young professionals for you to de uh, develop these things. So talking about uh, connectivity and location again. India has opened up uh, its uh, geospatial data. So earlier it was a very licensed domain. You had to apply for uh, license to start working on that area. But today it is deregulated. So anybody can use GPS. You can build applications based on maps. So talking about electric vehicles, that is the fourth trend. So electric vehicles, all of you know, every country has set its own deadline when it wants to stop making internal combustion engine or ICE vehicles. But the biggest chal the challenges for electric vehicle adoption are three. One is the price of the vehicle, where 30% of the cost goes just for the battery. But it, its price is gradually coming down. And then the driver anxiety, which is because of the... Uh, limited, which is because of the uh, lack of charging stations and the... Uh, low driving range that batteries have today. So again, if you can connect these... Uh, uh, Trends that I spoke about, connected cars with location, with GPS, geospatial data. You can come up with an application which gives you an optimized path to go from your home to office. If you are stuck somewhere in between, it will show you where is the nearest charging station. The Bharat Petroleum, for example, recently has announced that it's going to make every petrol station a charging station. I think it's 7,000 is the number. Tata Group has some plans to build more charging stations. So the charging station issue is, is going to be uh, addressed shortly. So young professionals like you who pick up the right set of skill sets are going to have an amazing time where all these trends converge. It's it's up to you to identify where you want to be. So this is an interesting quote which uh, Volkswagen CEO said. Basically Ford, today even Hyundai, everybody's talking about mobility. Auto industry is moving away from a product-based industry 
to a service based industry and even more ideally a mobility based industry so i want to travel from point a to point b in in the most sustainable way in a responsible way where i don't waste fuel my carbon footprint is least so all auto oems today uh, especially after the cop cop 26 that we had in glasgow two weeks back there is a lot of focus on sustainability we'll touch upon that also so case is a trend and it is no longer futuristic uh, it is already happening in india i gave you several examples and these trends are converging so how is it converging <coughs> so this is how it is converging so on the the four small circles are case and at the center of it you have the future automobile so how is the future automobile going to be it is going to be an ideal sustainable responsible vehicle so again uh, mr mohan touched upon sustainability there is a lot of focus on it so sustainability is not just about reduction of tail pipe uh, emission reduction by switching to electric vehicles electric vehicles itself we need to make sure that the charging happens using renewable sources otherwise there is no point in going for it but manufacturers even in the way vehicles are designed and manufactured there is a lot of focus on sustainability uh, i will give you some examples so at the bottom this was a very recent article which i saw tata motor says that sustainability and carbon neutrality has started influencing the even the design of a car so there is an opportunity to practice sustainability across the entire life cycle of a car starting from how it is conceptualized how it is designed how it is manufactured how parts are procured how it is used and managing its end of life also so i will not go deep into sustainability but just wanted to stress upon this when we talk about convergence of uh, these uh, trends make sure sustainability is also kept in your mind because it is again a very very important opportunity so industry will look for a lot of ideas on how to become sustainable so mahindra for example that igatpuri factory is a zero waste factory ford for example globally took up a target they said uh, 70% of water usage should be reduced by i think 2020 was the target they had they're pretty close to achieving it around 3000 liters of water is uh, used in the factory to make each car so there's a lot of opportunity to reduce so that is responsible manufacturing when you use the least amount of natural resources like water and electricity for making a car you start moving towards a responsible manufacturing talking about uh, tata motors so they earlier used to you make clay models of uh, parts so that causes its own footprint now they are going to use digital mockups so that uh, these uh, clay parts are avoided they are using virtual reality to uh, to have an experience of car design and then a lot of travel is avoided by their engineers working remotely so not just tata motors uh, multiple oems are looking at sustainability so when you look at case as a futuristic trend make sure you look at the sustainability and not just post sale of the car but across the entire life cycle of the car <laughs> so now let's come to the why part so we talk about so much change happening in auto industry why exactly is it happening so it starts with consumer preference so youngsters millennials today they don't want to buy a car they want an affordable car they want to change it you buy a car after 6 months you don't like the model or the color you want to change it so they want affordability choice flexibility so that's one driving factor the next two important factors are technology and regulations so in my opinion these are the two important most important drivers which are driving this uh, transformation in the auto industry competition has al- always been there and supply constraints again this is a topic by itself the chip shortage all of you are aware of it me and dr shankar have been working on this topic we can take a session only on this this itself is pushing auto industry to change manufacturing in many ways but let's not go into that so for this session we will limit ourselves to technology and regulations how are these two factors driving the auto industry for change so when you talk about uh, technology it is uh, it is broadly called digital transformation so all of you would have heard this term so let's get into the details of digital transformation what is digital transformation and why is it causing the auto industry to change so much <coughs> the digital transformation very broadly is the use of uh, technologies to radically improve the performance or reach of enterprises so you can broadly split it into four buckets process part paisa part or the way companies make money the product part and people part 
So on the left side, these two are pretty understandable, the process part. So today you have robotic process automation. If you want to apply for a car loan or if you want to apply for a bank account, you just fill it up, fill a, fill a form and there is a backend uh, bot which takes care of the process. People part, our structures are getting uh, flatter. Incentives for salespeople are changing. So we will not go too much into that. When we talk about the PISA part, that's where the shared service model comes in. So servitization is a very popular trend. So again, Marathi has this uh, Marathi subscribe feature. Uh, this is again a very broad topic. So we recently wrote a chapter on this in an upcoming book. So I will not go too much into detail on it, but be aware of uh, this. So this is one of the broad trends of digital transformation, which is enabled again by technologies like connectivity, electric cars. Those type of technologies make this business model easy to implement. And the product itself is undergoing change. It is becoming connected. It's becoming electric. In fact, Volkswagen CEO said the software enabled revenues is going to be as big as that of selling the product itself by 2030. So we will look at the details of it. So this is broadly digital transformation. Let's go deeper into that. Why is digital transformation happening at this point of time? So one answer for that is Moore's law. So for those of you who have done computer science and generally everybody's aware of it today, so Gordon Moore was the one of the founders of Intel, uh, one of the leaders of Intel. In the 60s, he made a prediction when a magazine asked him where is computing industry headed. So he said computing power is going to double every two years. So he thought it will hold uh, good for about a decade, but even now it is continuing. So uh, the, the number of transistors, capacitors, the components that go into an integrated circuit has been doubling every two years. So the size has been shrinking. Today we are talking about four nanometers, five nanometers. At the same time, the cost has been falling down. So all this has led to a shrinking in size. So this picture that you see here was taken in the US in the 60s. This was used for a census type of application for a city in US. So today you can hold the entire list of census data for a city or a town in a mobile phone itself. That's how much it has shrunk. So one question here that comes is, have we seen the end of Moore's law or is it still going to continue? How much shrinking can really happen? But that's where again, technology says, I'm here to you know bring it more. So we have Google's tensor flow processing units. We have uh, quantum computing coming up, which is so many uh, orders of magnitude, much, much greater than what our traditional chips can do today. So this is going to happen a new version of Moore's law, for example. But the basic idea is that computing is getting democratized. It is getting cheaper, affordable. It is shrinking in size. So it is inevitable that these type of transformation is going to happen. So some more details of how software and electronic content is increasing in cars. So the uh, expert opinion is that by 2030, by end of this decade, close to half the value of a car will uh, consist of software and electronic type of components. So that gives you an idea. This is a breakup of it. So Mr. Mohan also spoke about it. The lines of code in an automobile is growing exponentially. The, the uh, number of electronic components is going up. Along with it, when you put in electrification also, it becomes easier to digitize an automobile. This is another uh, proper, uh, popular cliched statement, which most of you would have heard. Data is the new oil. So earlier crude oil price used to play havoc with global economies. So countries have fought wars for control of oil fields, but today the equivalent of it is becoming data. So today there are, uh, you know, points of view that elections are influenced by using data on social media. So in a I'm not going to the details of it, but data is becoming uh, very, very valuable. Again, this is not something for developed countries. Even in countries like India, just to give you an example, when IRCTC went for an IPO, it has valued so much. So we were talking just before this session started about some of the recent IPOs. So data is going to be very important. More importantly, analytics on top of it. So you, you can call it the anal analogy of... Uh, refining of crude oil just like how crude oil is refined to produce diesel petrol and so many byproducts analytics is very important artificial intelligence machine learning is very important to take the raw data produced by technologies like iot and to come out with meaningful actionable insights 
So data becoming a new oil again is a very important trend for all of you to be aware of. So now let's come to the regulatory part. Why is there so much uh, noise about auto industry reducing its style pipe emission? So if you look at uh, the US snapshot, who are the main contributors for greenhouse gas emissions? So the two big culprits are the power generation industry and the auto industry. Both of them roughly contribute about one third each. So auto industry recently overtook the power industry. So the uh, transportation industry is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emission in US. And if you look at the footprint on the right side here, this is, this is a split up of the greenhouse gases produced by transportation industry alone in 2018. The so passenger cars alone are, it's close to 41%. So if you see the bar charts in the center, this is a comparison of the uh, CO2 emission of a conventional or IC vehicle versus an electric vehicle. Obviously, there is a lot of reduction in greenhouse gas emission. So all these studies have been going on for a long time. But again, thanks to COP26, uh, which our prime minister also attended recently, there is again a lot of focus on reduction of greenhouse gas emission and carbon footprint. Uh, and again, talking about uh, ethics and governance, this is also part of the regulatory uh, thing. Even now, uh, I was reading an article on Bloomberg. So electric scooters, their location tracking is enabled. Is that ethical or not? Are, are we intruding into privacy? So there have been a lot of governance and ethics issues in the auto industry. One very unpopular, infamous one is the Volkswagen diesel gate scandal. Most of you would be aware the OEM played with some of the onboard controls during testing of the vehicle for emission standards, right? So these are some of the ethics and governance issues which the auto industry has been facing. So regulatory pressure is again there for the auto industry to change itself. And the other big need is the need for a circular economy. Again, this goes back to sustainability. Uh, again, the, going back to the Tata Motors examples, they said 90-95% of the vehicle can be recycled. So this is again an opportunity for you. So me and Dr. Shankara working with some uh, uh, with IIT Madras on some opportunities on how to enable circularity in the auto industry. So I will not go into the details of it, but keep this in mind. So let auto industry not be seen as a linear industry where you buy from the OEM, end of life, you dump it, it goes to some scrapyard. That's a very wrong way for future generations and even for business models. We need to see how the end of life vehicle can be circulated back to the auto industry. Okay, so we looked at the why part. So now let's look at where exactly is the case trend today. So connected cars, again, I gave you the Marty example. This slide is a little old than that, but it gives you an idea. Like I said before, consumers stand to benefit from it for security, safety, and convenience. If your car is getting towed, the Marty Connect advanced telematics application can identify because the engine is not on, the vehicle's location is changing. So it will give you an alarm saying somebody is trying to tow it away. So if you have parked it in the wrong location, you get an alert. So safety is taken care. If the airbag is deployed, you can send an emergency SMS to whoever you want. So for the OEMs, if you want a subscription-based model, then you need to be responsible for the quality of the vehicle. It cannot go down. It has to run for so many miles between services new types of insurance are enabled. So connected cars was a futuristic trend a trend a few years back, but it is going to slowly become a very basic feature. And when combined with other technologies, it enables new ways like uh, usage-based insurance, driver patterns, based insurance, all that. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ramchandran, could we have the slides of this presentation later, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, definitely. Uh, there will be no issue, I suppose. Uh, no issues. I've given most of the references. It is with Mr. Mr. Mohan. I'll just make uh, check once and share it with you. No issue. Thank you so much. Sorry for the interruption. Thank okay. you. Yeah, normally those who uh, fill up the feedback form will get the video recording plus the presentation and some additional reference material. <coughs> Please do fill up the feedback form. Okay. Okay. Done. Done, sir. Done. Okay. So that was a snapshot of uh, connected cars, which is becoming. Uh, like I said, a very basic feature. Now, let's look at autonomous cars. So in autonomous cars, it's a very, very broad topic. It's very difficult to pinpoint. I mean, there are several analyst predictions on what is the size of the industry. I'm not going into all that. But this was an inter interesting scenario analysis which McKinsey had shared. 
so at the bottom the blue lines is if there is load disruption and the, on the top is if there is high disruption so i was reading one interesting article uh, we were talking about tesla cars again before we started the session there was one interesting article which said drivers felt like a dr jekyll or mr hyde type of situation when driving an autonomous tesla car in some situations they felt like taking their hands off the wheel the car used to drive on its own perfectly safe under control but in some very basic situations they had to intervene and take over control of the car so it, autonomous driving is, is still a long way to go but that's where we need to look at these levels it is not a binary situation of manual or autonomous cars these are the different levels of autonomy dr shankar will again touch upon this in detail so like i said initially advanced driver assist systems are already available starting to make their presence in uh, cars even in india so it is a big opportunity so when we go into the architecture of the car we'll go into more details of it this is the status of electric vehicles on the uh, left side on the y axis you see the situation in 2020 and on the uh, right extreme on y axis that's the situation in 2030 so around 53% of vehicles are going to be non uh, internal combustion engine vehicles there are different vehicles not just electric vehicles it could be a hybrid vehicle it could be a hydrogen driven vehicle <laughs> so uh, i spoke about some of the barriers for electric vehicle adoption interestingly some oems themselves are against this trend you might be surprised to know even toyota is actually has raised some concerns on adoption of electric vehicle their ceo recently made some points and said it should be left to cons- consumers why should governments take a technical decision of shifting to electric vehicles they agree in principle that greenhouse gas emissions have to be reduced but they have already invested in other alternate technologies like fuel cells hydrogen based uh, cars so their point is that uh, you know the technology should be left to consumers why govern- government should not force electric adoption of battery electric vehicle uh, driven vehicles but this is a prediction and uh, these numbers are steadily going up so electric vehicles will obviously be a big trend to watch out for so we saw these three big trends so if you ask me where what is the maturity level of each of these technologies gartner's hype cycle is a very useful tool to uh, look at the maturity of technologies for those of you who are aware of it uh, of this hype cycle you would have seen this before this is specifically for connected cars so in the y axis you have different stages in the maturity level starting from basic innovation and then there is suddenly a lot of media hype when the curve goes up and then once the hype goes it it comes down and then becomes a plateau of productivity so very ideally if you see i have circled the three trends that we spoke about connected car platforms is becoming mature <clears throat> it is reaching the plateau of productivity electric vehicles is reaching the slope of enlightenment as the cost comes down as charging stations go up more and more people are starting to buy so the percentage share of vehicles uh, sold as electric vehicles is going to go up globally different continents different countries are facing different levels of adoption automobile uh, autonomous vehicles is uh, still you know uh, picking up after all the hype has gone down so gartner's hype cycle is an interesting tool to understand the maturity <coughs> so now let's look at the employment part right again this is not of my concern for you so i'm not going too much into detail on it but this is more for experienced professionals so these black dots is where there will be loss of employment because of the uh, case trend so marketing sales and distribution is take, going to take a hit again this is mckinsey's prediction around 14% of job loss will be there so if you look at the tesla model right they don't have dealers they have a direct to consumer model so even other dealers in us are worried if they will lose their business so it's not just about engineers and manufacturing even marketing sales and distribution is getting affected by this uh, case trend manufacturing obviously electric vehicles have so few parts compared to the combustion engine parts so manufacturing will take a 10% hit in employment plus support functions but so around 20 to 30% of job loss will be there but on the flip side this is what is of interest for you so software and it is going to pick up there will be a plus 6 i think is a very conservative number it's going to jump up you know it already a lot of multinational companies are starting to set up their uh, centers in uh, india those who missed the earlier wave digital marketing and sales is going to pick up 
data analytics again you you know the recent ipos that have been happening so net net there is going to be a slight loss of uh, employment again it varies from country to country it's not something for you to worry about but these blue dots is what is of concern for most of you because you are going to start your career so you can be aware of where the industry is headed you still need the foundations of an automobile nothing will take away the importance of uh, those basics but then if you know where the industry is headed where are the market needs so we call it the ikigai right if you can identify the purpose of your life if there is an intersection of what you are good at what you are passionate in doing plus what the market needs plus a high paying job then nothing like it you have an amazing career in front of you so talking about skill sets it's not just about the programming so on the right side you see the hard skills starting from ai ml you need to know uh, programming languages like python or r but those are just tools the basic algorithms are very very important it is like knowing a language right? whether it's english hindi tamil telugu so don't stop with programming languages get your foundations very strong on top of it if you know these languages it is going to help you so when we study it was c++ and java became popular today python and r more such languages are becoming popular those languages may change but the basics are not going to go away so these are the hard skills on the left side these are the soft skills creativity problem solving like i said very basic things like use case identification is something where the industry is struggling if you look at connected cars we spoke about a lot of use cases from a consumer perspective from the oem perspective we spoke about how geospatial data is getting deregulated in india so if you put all these together if uh, young professionals like you can come up with very meaningful use cases that will be that's what the industry really expects so you have a big opportunity there so among all this if you ask me storytelling is again a very interesting soft skill which puts together all of these things so you will be surprised today large companies like general electric microsoft they have a role called a chief storyteller because today products and businesses have become so complex it is difficult for business leaders to explain it to investors to the board even to their own employees so companies have a chief storyteller so in, in uh, general electric we used to call it a, an elevator speech if you happen to bump into your uh, principal your hod or after you join a company any senior leader if they ask you so what are you doing so you should be able to quickly uh, summarize what you are doing it should be of interest to them so the same thing applies here if you are an engineer with with an entrepreneurship uh, interest or if you are going to take up a career in a corporate whatever it is you should be able to have a clarity of thought on what is your interest and where you want to work on so keep in mind the skill sets part again this was a book we we wrote a book called new skilling for digital transformation based only on the skill set i can keep talking for hours only on the skills part but the key takeaway here is that in all courses that you do whatever you attend make sure you pick up some skill it could be a hard skill or it could be a soft skill okay now coming to the architecture of an autonomous car i will not go into the details of it so in the front we have the sensors this is like the sense organs that we have today we have cameras radars lidars there is a big discussion again coming back to tesla elon musk feels that a camera is the right sensors to use lidar or light detection right so lasers are used to sense the distance between the car and objects you basically use using these sensors a car does location estimation so you know where the car is and then you do the environment mapping is there another car in front is there a tree in front is there a median and then motion planning decides how to move forward from the source to destination based on the environment environment map you have a controller to translate this motion planning into the vehicle's parameters what should be the speed what should be the steering wheel angle and on top of all this you have the supervisor so dr shankar will go into this in detail i will not go into it so just to give you a snapshot this is how the auto industry used to look like before so you have auto manufacturers on the left side like toyota honda daimler these are the oems they used to have tier 1 auto suppliers they in turn had tier 2 tier 3 suppliers and on the right side you have retailers you had the aftermarket this was how the industry used to look like but now you have many more entrants you can keep on adding here so earlier detroit was the center of auto industry now silicon valley is giving a stiff competition for the uh, uh, traditional oems in uh, detroit so 
I will end with uh, this slide. If you look at uh, some of the businesses that were there before, so for those of you who can recall, earlier cameras used to come with these film rolls. Now all that is gone. All that you need is a mobile phone. Similarly, you had all these physical media channels, especially the uh, post-COVID scenario has made the situation even more difficult. Publish, book publishers, magazine publishers are finding it very difficult to make this print uh, business uh, very profitable. So even CDs, typewriters, all this has, has, is going away, getting replaced by laptops and computers. Similarly, if you look at the auto industry, it's a matter of time before IC engine, uh, internal combustion engine driven vehicles go away and make for electric vehicles. And when you talk about electric vehicles, don't look at it as one individual technology. It is going to be a convergence of connected vehicles, electric vehicles with autonomous features, with new business models like shared vehicles. So I gave you what uh, you know how the employment opportunities looking at where are the growth opportunities, what type of skill sets to pick up. So with that, I will end my session. I hope I've been on time. So Dr. Shankar will now take over from where I left off and go into more details. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ram, for your wonderful presentation and also the setting the stage for uh, Shankar to take the heart. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just sharing my screen. It just take a minute to come up. Once it's ready, we will continue the discussion. <clears throat> So thanks, Ram, for setting the context and giving a very quick overview of what's happening in the space. And what I will try to do is uh, do a bit of a deep dive into the various technologies that Ram talked about. Sure. So I don't know, it's still taking time. <clears throat> So meanwhile, if you have any quick questions for Ram, why don't you quickly ask so that by the time my screen comes up, we have some discussion around what Ram said. Sir, questions we will take up at the okay. end of this. Sure, sure. No harm that. Just please wait then. Um, yeah. I'm still you there. Want, you want us to present it? Uh, possibly you could do, sir. Please do that. Sakti, can you do that? Saktiwell? Saktiwell, can you present? Sakti or PBS, can any one of you can present? Uh, one second, sir. Let me... Okay, Sakti started presenting. Okay. Dr. Shankar, presentation is uh, being done from local system. I think he got disconnected, sir. We'll wait for a minute. Let him join back. Yeah.
Are you able to hear me now? Shall we go ahead? Yeah, yeah, please, sir. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, friends. I'm going to build on uh, what uh, Ram introduced to you as uh, the interesting developments in the space. So let me do a quick deep dive into various technologies that are making this happen. Sure. If you can move to the next slide, that's basically my title slide, which is um, the convergence of these uh, four technologies, rather the electric, connected, autonomous, and shared is what I will deep dive into. The very next chart talks about my, uh, the, if you can move to the next chart, please. Yeah, okay, you can skip this. This is just a profile, please move ahead. Yeah. Well, what is exciting about all the new technologies that Ram gave an overview of is if you look at each of these technologies and the impact that they can create, uh, you see that all the green boxes in the bottom of the chart show the extremely positive impact that each of these technologies will have on the environment. Okay. This is very important, especially with the recent uh, uh, COP26 announcements by the world leaders, you can imagine why it is very important for us to switch over to a very sustainable mobility option. And almost all of the technologies that we'll be talking today has a very, very positive impact on the environment. The sooner we switch over, the better for us as a world to do this. So you can look at the next chart. So that's where I'm going to start with the very first technology, which is the electric vehicle technology. Um, can any one of you guess um, how, when was the electric vehicle introduced in the market? When was it that somebody could pay money and buy an electric vehicle? Can you just take a guess? Can you just um, type in a chat bar or somewhere? The year in which electric vehicle was available in the market. Just take a guess. Nineteen twenties, eighteen sixty-one. So we have two answers. Somebody says nineteen twenty, somebody says eighteen sixty-one, and uh, let us see when exactly this happened. If we can move to the next chart, <clears throat> please move. Yes, the year was nineteen hundred, and I'm going to talk about the five years, the momentous five years, nineteen hundred to nineteen o five. Of course, that was the birth of quantum mechanics. Planck, while trying to solve the black body radiation, came up with this beautiful world called quantum, which went on to revolutionize the world. And Einstein, around the same time, said that photons can hit a metal and lead to the emission of electrons. And there was a photoelectric effect, and he got a Nobel Prize for that. This is all that long back. And at the same time, you can see an electric bus. There are a whole bunch of people sitting on this electric bus. And this bus had a range of, guess what, 100 miles. And this was traveling at 6 to 12 miles per hour. And had 24 storage battery cells. So this is an electric bus, which was there between 1900 and 1905. So if electric vehicle is a technology that is so old, then what happened to it? What happened? Why didn't we hear anything about it at all, all these years? And why now everybody is talking about it as if it's something so new? Let's look at the next chart, which talks about if you want to buy a car, if you are in 1900 and you wanted to buy a car, you had three options. You could buy a steam-powered car, a gasoline-powered car, or an electric car. It's a steam-powered car. Basically, whenever you run out of fuel, you have to carry a large amount of water, pour it, wait for it to heat and become steam, and then you can continue traveling. So this was a pain. With gasoline, the fuel was much easier. The operation was a little easier. But one pain point with the gasoline was the hand cranking. You had to crank it, and that took a lot of effort, then only it would start. And people were not too happy, the hand cranked gasoline car. But the electric car didn't have all those problems. It was quite cool, very smooth, easy to go around. So people actually preferred the electric car or the steam and the gasoline car. This was early 1900, friends. But between 1900 and 1935, something happened which made the electric cars vanish. The gasoline cars became the mainstream option. Can you guess what could have happened? So such a big thing between 1905 and 1935, 
that led to the disappearance of the electric cars. Because if you look at the next chart, we are not just talking about one or two electric cars. Almost one third of the car on the road were electric cars. Here you see a fleet of hundreds of electric cars owned by this company. This is a garage of the company. So we are talking about a road in 1905 with one third of the cars being electric. And something happened between 1905 and 1935 that led to the disappearance of the electric cars. And we have one of the audience says that it's easy and cheaper oil that led to the disappearance of electric cars. Very valid. Any other thoughts why this could have happened? Anything else that you can think of? Battery size and capacity to have higher power. Okay. Model T perhaps. I think you're all right. If you look at my next chart, please, next chart. Yes. Model T, of course, is one of the things that brought down the price of the car by almost half. Okay. 600 odd dollars is what it costed to get a Model T. And the hand cracking was no longer a pain because Charles Kettering, whom you see here, came up with the electric starter. So you don't need to hand crank anymore. And of course, oil was struck in Texas and then made a very, very attractive option. And by 1935, there was hardly any electric cars on the road. And then the journey was entirely gasoline. From there, it became the mainstream. Over the years, few options, alternatives to gasoline have come up, but this has been the mainstream. So we never had a chance to look back at the potential that the electric offered as early as 1900. So this has been a long journey. And now the time has come for the electric car, friends. There is no looking back. It's waited long enough. It's waited for more than 100 years. And now there is no more waiting. It's the, it's ready. And it's ready for you and me to actually go ahead and use the electric car today. Okay. Let's see what happened and how it happened. We can move to the next chart. Let me quickly tell you the story behind the other three technologies also. This is connected vehicle. If you can look at the next chart on connected vehicle, you would see that in the connected journey started a little early on. Can you move to the next chart? Yeah. Around uh, 1995 onwards, people have been bringing a variety of cars with connected features to the market. And um, the whole thing took a really big momentum picked up with the IoT coming in in a big way. And then it became very, very affordable and also very versatile in terms of what the IoT can do in terms of smart and connected features. If you can move to the next chart, you will see what exactly we are trying to do here. We are trying to create a kind of a connectivity, which is V2X. X can be anything. X can be your infrastructure. X can be another vehicle. It can be the uh, pedestrian on the road. It can be anything and everything. But uh, enabling each one of this is not the same story. Each brings its own challenge. So it has been a journey for us over the years to bring different levels of connectivity in many different ways. V2I, for example, is intelligent transportation systems where we look at bi-directional exchange of information. It's really attractive in terms of enhancing the safety and preventing the accidents. V2V is data exchange in real time. You are looking at fast-moving cars, so speed, location, direction, etc. All the mesh network with each vehicle as a node is what we are talking about when it is V2V. V2H, of course, is the vehicles talking to your household appliances, like your refrigerator or the air conditioning system or even your TV. Of course, a lot of this is also important in terms of the electric vehicles, the kind of a big battery pack that carry around, they can also generate energy and upload it to the grid. So that's where we have V2G, which is the grid connectivity. And from the pedestrian safety perspective, we need to have V2P, which is the ability of the car to communicate with the pedestrian on the road. V2C, the cloud, where we have over the air updates in order to continuously keep updating new features and enable new propositions, value propositions for the customers purely through connectivity. So a whole bunch of stuff that is happening. And many of these cars, which have been launched in the one year, 
talk about a lot of the smart and connected features and um, this is becoming a key differentiator people talk about my car has uh, 25 smart features my car has 30 features and so on so people are no longer talking about fuel efficiency or this or that but talking more about the smart features and this is a low hanging fruit because the technology is fairly ready it's not too difficult people are also looking at some of the cyber security aspects to make sure that it's absolutely safe nobody is able to hack into your system and so on we can move to the next chart i'm going to quickly move over to the autonomous part to say how did the autonomous evolve over the years if we can again move to the next chart the evolution of autonomous started way back in 1970s the year that i was born that the autonomous vehicle had already been introduced in 1970 but the real momentum for this came up in 2004 with the darpa challenge coming in the first year of the challenge none of the vehicles could even cross 2 miles and the goal was to it was held in a desert the goal was to really reach the destination not a single vehicle made to, managed to do that but the next year 2005 so many vehicles could do that and the team from carnegie mellon university actually went on to win the darpa prize and the the real momentum for autonomous vehicles picked up from 2005 onwards of course 2014 we have seen the google's driverless car which did millions of miles without any incidents and then tesla talks about autonomous features in its cars and uber talks about cabs with the autonomous uh, uh, features of different levels so a lot of things have started happening ever since 2005 and that's a very important milestone for the autonomous cars now enough of history let's talk about what's uh, how we are doing it today and uh, what are the different features that are getting enabled by the convergence of these technologies right now okay if we can move to the next chart i'll just we are still at the blue part of this curve where we are looking at levels of automation where you are still the driver but moment you go to green you are no longer the driver okay the computer is the driver so today we are talking about only till level two. any vehicle which has a auto parking facility or any of those driver assist features all those things are limited to level 2 so you are still the driver you are responsible for what happens in the car and um, it will take some time for us to reach level 3 so this is uh, today's situation and if you can move to the next chart please yeah this is basically the architecture that most oems are using to build that autonomous vehicles at mahindra we are focused more on autonomous tractors rather than autonomous car we have built a small compact tractor which is uh, semi autonomous this was almost 2 years back and now we are building the next version of this so this is at an indian price this is not too expensive and indian farmer can actually buy this tractor and use we went for the tractor option primarily because uh, manpower is a big big challenge in the indian villages these days with most people having moved to the nearby towns um you don't the farmer is, really finds it very difficult to get labor and uh, so bringing in technology at affordable price in the agricultural practices especially is becoming very important that's how we started with that uh, most of the architectures that we use whether in a car or in a tractor anything starts with the base layer where we look at the vehicle control which is basically the acceleration steering the suspensions the transmission systems and so on this is um, basically where we start with and this is where it also makes a difference whether it's ic engine vehicle or whether it's electric vehicle the next layer is sensing that we have a variety of vehicle sensors then we fuse the outputs from these sensors and then we need connectivity now the top layer is the intelligence Uh, that we use to make sense out of all the sensor outputs and make a decision that will uh, help the car to move forward so this is a simple architecture vehicle level at the foundation level sensing at the intermediate level and the processing and the decision making right at the top of this whole architecture and you can look at the next chart please here you see that the functional architecture the way it happens is the sensors are part of the hardware and then you have the v2x connectivity that i mentioned earlier and then you also have the actuators these are all part of the hardware stack and then you have a software stack which is primarily looking at perception planning and control 
and there is a continuous communication between these two layers. Actual vehicle has a physical layer, then the hardware layer, then the software layer, then the cloud connectivity. So there are multiple layers and the performance of these vehicles, whether it's electric, connected or autonomous, is actually comes out of the interactions across these multiple layers. All this come together to deliver the expected performance. Sure. Now, if you really move to the next chart, you would understand a simple situation and how the autonomous vehicle would handle this situation. Okay. So, what would be the scenario that basically the autonomous vehicle has to first detect? This is where what kind of sensors you use, whether you use a camera or a LiDAR or a radar, is going to make a difference. Once you detect, you have to segment. Here you are trying to bring all the light data points together and create clusters. Then you classify classify as to what kind of thing is it? Is it a human being? Is it an animal? Is it another vehicle? Is it a traffic signal? And what not the classification. Then you decide to monitor. Which one you want to monitor, which one you want to ignore. All those intelligent decision making happens at this layer. So these are typically the four critical functions that an autonomous vehicle should be capable of doing. The next chart, please. Simple situation, okay? It's a, you're in an autonomous vehicle, so you're not driving. You're just a passenger, and that vehicle is driving by itself, and you are at a signal, okay? Now, the signal is initially red, so you have stopped. Now, the signal turns green, and you are ready to move forward, okay? If you're a person, you can easily make out that the signal has turned green. You can move ahead, but you're not driving. So in this case, it is actually an autonomous car. So the sensors, basically, they have to process the raw information from the environment. Does not know what exactly it means. Okay, All that happens is the traffic signal communicates to the car that the red has become green. Now the perception stage, the vehicle has to convert this information and say green means I can start moving forward. But unfortunately, in this case, what happens, there is a pedestrian who is crossing the car. So if you are driving, you can use hit the pedestrian. You can't hit the pedestrian, so you are going to wait for it. Even though the signal has turned green, you are going to wait for the pedestrian to cross. Then only you will move forward. But the simple decision making is a lot more complex in the case of autonomous vehicle. Because now it has to various rules. It has one rule can override another rule. One rule says when it's green, you should start moving. But another rule says you cannot hit a human being. So that second rule takes precedence and that says since there is a pedestrian crossing, you have to wait once he crosses and the signal, if it is still green, then you can move ahead. Simple situation like this itself, there is a lot of complexity that happens. And all this analysis, everything has to happen in a fraction of a second for the vehicle to really move in a real dynamic environment. But there are bigger challenges. This is not just this one. I will tell you something much, much bigger and a lot more difficult to address. If you can move to the next chart. This is a sensor fusion that Ram talked about, where you have the option of doing the fusion at three levels. A high-level fusion, a low-level, and a mid-level. Um, before I explain how this happens, I'll just tell you what kind of sensors we actually use in our autonomous tractor or any other autonomous car. Please move to the next chart. Yeah. So, a uh, LiDAR is very popular. So, uh, I'm sure you would have heard about the LiDAR. And one of the most famous companies, Velodyne, recently has set up its uh, India R&D center in Bangalore. So, there is a lot of uh, discussion around the Velodyne LiDARs. Basically, this is good for long-range detection. And high-resolution 3D modeling is what this is capable of. And the only thing is poor visibility in fog, dust, rain, or snow. This is something that you need to consider. So, always people use a combination of multiple sensors with complementary capabilities, actually. Uh, red for on the other hand, is unaffected by the weather conditions. It will always work in a variety of weather conditions. But it has limited depth. And a simple camera, and there are more advanced versions of this camera, it can easily distinguish shapes and colors and classify the objects very effectively. But it has limited contrast and no depth perception at all, actually. So it's very difficult to quantify any distance information if it's only cameras. So end of the day, you need to have all these three and you have to decide at what level you want to fuse, whether unprocessed sensor data you want to fuse, semi-processed, 
or after processing the data from each sensor, you will bring them together. That's a low, medium, and high level fusion that I had mentioned in my previous chart. Now we can move to the next chart. This is what I want to spend a minute on. This is the moral dilemmas that many of the self-driving cars actually go through. This is the most difficult part of the whole technology development. Okay. So for example, the, I would refer you to this the brilliant paper called The Moral Machine Experiment, which was published in Nature by a bunch of scientists from different universities who came together, did an online experiment actually, where there are different scenarios for autonomous vehicles. write this particular paper. So for example, when they did this, they gave different scenarios, situations. Okay, Look at this. There is a situation where the autonomous car has to make a decision. Whether there are two options. It can avoid only one and it has to hit the other. Very limited options. Okay? So there is a person and there is a dog. So most people who took the survey, they said that you should save the person. If you can save only one, you should save the person rather than the dog. Okay. The other thing was, if there is a child and if there is a very old person, then you should save the child. The third was, if there is a group of people, say three or four people, on one side, and sacrifice that one person. Now, these are some common trends. From the decisions, the survey people who took the survey, these are the things that came. And also some interesting patterns emerge that the people who took the survey from different parts of the globe, coming from different regions and different cultures, they had very distinct responses. There are cultures where the life of a young person was given the same value as the life of an old person. There are some cultures where they preferred one over the other. But this early experiment when they Hello, sir. No lights. No audio from your side. Yes, sir. No, connectivity must be there. He's, he's at Coimbatore, some connectivity issue. I'm sorry about the connectivity loss. So we, let's move from this to the next chart. So in the interest of time, yes. This is where I want to show you what a convergence of these four technologies can act. This is very important to understand this. What is the synergy between these four technologies? Why we have to look at this together rather than individually? Let's move to the next chart. Here I'm showing the three big challenges when you try to solve the urban mobility problem. One is, of course, the pollution. We talk about the tailpipe emission especially of vehicles that burn fossil fuel and lead to the polluting the environment. The second is the accidents that we very often see when vehicles moving at very high speeds, especially on the highways, <clears throat> lead to accidents, and then loss of life. This is, uh, there is technology in place today to entirely avoid and relate to, which is the traffic congestions which almost all the cities in India are going through today. So when we talk about sustainable mobility, we are looking at what technologies can actually solve all these three problems. Because solving any one problem is not sufficient. We have to solve all three. For example, if you are in an electric car, it's an autonomous car. But if you are stuck in a traffic jam, it's not going to make a difference. You still won't be able to reach your destination in time. So we need to solve all the three problems 
if we want to create a sustainable mobility for the future. That's why I'm going to talk about a combination of all four. We move to the next chart. Yes. I'm going to first look at a combination of electric and shared vehicle. Okay. For a moment, it doesn't have any connected features. It does not have autonomous features. It's only electric and it's a shared car. Please move to the next chart. Yes. So since it is electric, there is no tailpipe emission and there will be fewer vehicles, lower fuel cost and easier maintenance. Fewer vehicles because it's also a shared vehicle. Four people are traveling, they will use one. So that's a logic. So the first problem of pollution is handled. And the last problem of traffic jam is to some extent handled because re reduced traffic congestion because of fewer vehicles on the road, which leads to less fuel cons consumption, faster travel times, and uh, basically the stress-free drivers. But what is not being addressed is basically the accidents. There is no assurance that the safety is improved significantly and the vehicle is only electric and shared. That makes us explore whether bringing in autonomous and connected features would actually help us to address the second problem of safety also. So let us look at the next chart <coughs> where we are going to look at a vehicle which is electric and connected but does not have autonomous features and it's not a shared vehicle. Please move to the next chart. Remember, this is electric and also connected. So all the benefits of electric in terms of pollution-free is still there. Since it's connected, it's capable of V2V communication. So collision warning is possible. And uh, traffic signal and the car can communicate. So there is a V2I. And because of the connected features, there is going to be improved traffic flow management, lesser fuel consumption, reduced travel time, stress-free drivers, and more efficient parking also because the Okay, I'm very sorry about the connectivity loss. So primarily what we are trying to see here is any one or two technologies is not going to solve all the problem. We need to bring all four together if we want to really address, solve all the three problems of urban mobility. So I'm going to skip a couple of charts so that we can move towards the conclusion part since we are running out of time. So Shakti, I would like to request you to skip the next couple of charts and then move to, just keep moving, I'll tell you when to stop. Yes. Yes. Please move. Ah, stop here. 
Okay. Or uh, the previous one. Yes. So here, I want to show you a product. A car which has been on the roads, which has actually at the convergence of all the four technologies that we talked about. Only 1.0 already did this. It's been on the road for four or five years now. Now we are talking about the next generation, only 2.0. If you see this car, it's a, not a car, it's an eight-seater. It's uh, 3D printed. Almost 80% of it is 3D printed. And it took only 10 hours to print this vehicle that you see here. It's made of a lot of advanced materials, lightweight composites and whatnot. And this vehicle has a range of 160 kilometers, the maximum speed of 40 kilometers per hour. It is a level four autonomy. Okay. And in fact, Olive One did not even have onboard intelligence. It was having basic sensors which will communicate to IBM Watson on the cloud. And Watson would analyze and instruct the car to accelerate or brake, move left or move right. That's a kind of technology with which it could navigate through dense traffic. Now we have a superior version, which is only 2.0, which can do even better than that. Okay. This is just an example to say we are not talking about a futuristic technology, but we have these vehicles on the road today, right now, okay? So you can move to the next chart. I want to tell you, if you are trying to bring this in India, what are the India's specific concerns that we should address? So I've shown you what is the mind of customers across the globe when it comes to electric vehicles. In India, it is specifically about the lack of charging infrastructure. What's the fun in having an electric car if you don't have a charging station? So people are worried that first build the charging station, then we will make up our mind to buy an electric car. So this is one of the biggest infrastructure challenges that we would face in the next few years till the charging infrastructure is completely in place. So we can move to the next chart. What is really interesting is the three big problems that customers have in mind about electric. One is the range anxiety. Whether the car would do sufficient distance for me to reach my destination. Second is the high battery cost. Because the battery contributes to almost 40 to 50% of the price of electric vehicle. Since the lithium-ion battery is expensive today, the electric car itself is expensive. The third is the lack of fast charging. Because we don't want to wait for three, four hours in a charging station. It has to be done within half an hour and we should be able to move. So how do we build a network of fast charging stations across the country? The next chart, please. Affordability. The battery cost has to be reduced. The infrastructure, the charging station cost has to be reduced. And most importantly, if you are looking at autonomous features, the cost of the LiDAR has to reduce. Then only you and I will be able to afford a car which has electric connected autonomous and shared features in it. So we, how do we bring this down and make it affordable in the next three to five years? Is a challenge that most of the automotive OEMs are very seriously looking at. So if you can move to the next chart. Surprise. The lithium-ion battery pack, which everybody says is so expensive, actually has reduced in price by more than 90% in just less 10 years. Just 10 years, 90% reduction. It's only 10% of what it used to cost before. That's the level of innovations, the breakthrough in technology that has happened in just the lithium-ion battery pack alone. So 90% price reduction is what made electric vehicles so affordable today. Okay. And it's expected to cross the $100 per kilowatt hour milestone when electric car would become a lot more economically attractive than an IC engine based car. And this is real data. So you should trust this. When I say 90%, it has actually fallen by more than 90% when it comes to certain chemistries. Please. The next chart, if you look at the LiDAR, the LiDAR, which is the eye of the autonomous car, used to be very bulky, more than 13 kgs it used to weigh. And it used to be very expensive also. If you can move to the next chart, it used to cost about $70,000. You can skip this chart. Please move to the next one. It used to cost more than $70,000 in 2012. And today we are talking about a LiDAR, which is less than $100. Okay. So $70,000 to $100 is a 99% drop in the price. So this is just over the last 13 years. And the LiDAR price has become so, so, so affordable. Unimaginable. Very few technologies have seen this kind of a such a steep fall in the price. And this is because these technologies are growing exponentially and they are also converging, which is making this whole thing so affordable. This is truly democratization of technology in many ways. You can move to the next chart. 
cost of EV charging stations has to be brought down. Especially in India, if you want to very quickly build this network, we have to look at installation cost, the hardware cost, and also the energy cost. Okay. We have to make sure that the energy generated is from renewable sources, not fossil fuels, clean green electricity used to charge our electric cars. So the EV charging stations have been growing exponentially in the developed countries. And in the next three years, you'll see that happening in India too. And just out of curiosity, since I live in Chennai, I was looking at Chennai to Pondicherry, the network of electric vehicle charging stations. You see that all these red spots are basically the charging stations. So you see a reasonably good network. You can very comfortably drive from Chennai to Pondicherry in your electric car today. Okay. So you can move to the next chart. I am not trying to predict what the future would be when it comes to electric, autonomous, connected, and shared. All I'm laying out is four distinct scenarios. Any one of this can happen. And as technologists, it's our responsibility to take a proactive action towards addressing each of the scenarios and making sure that we are reasonably ready. The first scenario, I call it as Rajasa, where there is a tremendous advance in technology especially autonomous vehicles and clean energy. And it's leading to low cost, high speed, sustainable travel. So the surge in mobility demand is goes up by 50%, 50% improvement. And then the share of shared mobility is about 40%. This is just one scenario where there is a lot of action and it's a very dynamic, and so I call it as a Rajasa scenario. The next is a Sattva scenario, where there is an increased environmental awareness Everybody wants to save the environment. They want to avoid unnecessary travel. So the travel distances are shorter, less frequent travel. Private ownership of vehicles reduced by 30%. And the share of public transportation is almost 40%. So this is a very good scenario. So the Sattva scenario is yet another scenario. Now look at the Tamasa scenario, which is where we don't take action. We are very lethargic. We just try to sleep on it and think that it will get solved by itself. The Tamasa scenario is inertia. In consumer behavior, lack of regulations. So there is a limited adoption of sustainable mobility and private ownerships will still fall by 10%. And the private car share will still remain 40%. This is a Tamasa scenario. The last one, which of course, I don't want it to happen, but this is a possible scenario, which is called the Vinasha. Here, failure to act leads to severe effects of climate change. Drastic measures taken to curb traffic as a last resort, because nothing else works. This is the only thing to do. Mobility demand falls by 40%, and the private car share reduces by 30%. But friends, honestly, none of us know which of the scenario will be there in 2040. But it's important for us to prepare ourselves for all those four scenarios so that we have technology options readily available with us to meet these requirements. 2040, I'm sure a lot of us will be still around. And so, unless we do something about it, we have to bear the consequences of not doing anything. Okay, let's move to the next chart. What I want to do, having laid out the technology, also having said what are the mistakes we did in the past, where we are today, I want you to really consider the four scenarios, the Rajasta, Sattva, Tamasa, and the Vinasha, and look at how you can be part of all these changes that we are looking at in terms of consumer behavior, in terms of product design, in terms of convergence of technology, adoption of new technologies, how you can be the change agent and how you can really reimagine the mobility options that we are going to create for the future. How we can move from linear incremental thinking to this exponential non-linear thinking so that we'll be able to really leverage these fast growing, exponential growing technologies and make sure that we are able to build a sustainable mobility option for our children and grandchildren. Friends, with this, I'd like to stop my presentation and take questions from you. Sure. So, uh, can I... Can I yeah, ask a question? For the, yes, sir. So thank you very much for the wonderful and informative presentation. So I will read out the questions which are received from the registered participants one by one and uh, please provide the answer for it. So in India, whether electric vehicle is possible? 
Absolutely possible. Yes. <laughs> Short answer for a very important question. Absolutely possible. Very much. Yes. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the research aspects of connectivity in autonomous vehicles? Connectivity in autonomous vehicles, we actually talked about V2X. So, of all the things that we talked about in V2X, not everything is there today. For example, when you talk about V2P, the pedestrian connectivity, or V2G, the grid connectivity, those are still happening. Those are at a research stage. Even V2V is still being researched. Okay. But uh, there are certain things which are easier. V2, some of the infrastructure, V2 I part, and also some of the things where we looked at uh, the car parking, uh, talking to the vehicle so that you can pre book your car parking slot and optimizing that and everything that is possible because a lot of time is wasted in people moving around looking for parking slots, especially in the heart of the cities. So that is an important problem to be addressed. And what is also being looked at is in terms of some of the cyber security aspects, improving the safety so that nobody can hack into your connected car. So that is a concern many customers had. Those things have really improved a lot in recent years. So Ram, would you like to add something to this? No, I'm fine, Dr. Shankar. I'll step in if I have anything. Go ahead. Okay. The next question is, even the chaotic driving practices in India, how does technology help autonomous driving a reality there? Yeah. Again, I will take we'll a talk about the levels, right? can add to that. Yeah, the level, levels. There's a couple of points that I have in mind immediately. Uh, one is, um, autonomous car on the Indian road will definitely take some time. Let's be realistic about it. But before that, the way I mentioned about autonomous tractors, we can have autonomous vehicles playing a very big role in mining, construction applications, in, um, in uh, border patrolling. For example, Siachen Glacier, where should we risk the life of a Jawan? We can have an autonomous vehicle with a camera going around and taking the pictures. A lot of things can be done before we talk about getting a vehicle on the and again, when we do that, initially there will be dedicated lanes only for the autonomous vehicles because when there are autonomous and non-autonomous vehicles, it's a very messy situation. So initially it will be on dedicated lanes, actually, when it will get introduced. That will continue for the first five years or so before we really talk about boldly introducing autonomous vehicle in a crowd of non-autonomous vehicles. That will take some more time. So, But there is a lot that we can do before getting into that. That's the reason why we started with the tractors that we are seeing a huge impact. Okay, I'll hand it to Ram. You want to add something, Ram? No, fine, Dr. Shankar. Just to add to what you said, don't look at autonomy as a binary option, but we look at the levels of autonomy. Right? Absolutely. So we talking about level five one, levels level of autonomy. Actually, a lot of the activity will be at level two and level three to start with, because I'm sure many of you still want to drive the vehicle. You don't want to sit passively in your car. You like driving. So you want to be there. But once we cross three, four, five, when you get, you are no longer the driver. Michael is going to drive you. I don't know whether you like it or not. So let's. Okay, sir. Next question. Are hybrid type tracked vehicles for military purpose used extensively? Can you repeat the question? Are hybrid type tracked vehicles for military purposes used extensively? Hybrid tracked vehicles for military okay. applications. So I, I didn't fully get the question, but I will take the hybrid part of it and tell you what it is. Then you can explain the question to me. See, hybrid is where we have both the engine and also the battery and the motor. And uh, some uh, companies took that path of creating a hybrid vehicle. Because if you run out of charge, then you will switch over to the engine. As the engine runs, the battery also will get charged. Okay, This is good when there is no charging infrastructure. But the problem there was... Uh, the price will go up because you are having both engine and the battery and the motor. And the weight also will go up, which is really bad from an efficiency perspective. So that's why we decided to skip this hybrid thing, directly get into a fully battery-powered electric vehicle. And many other companies are doing the same. So um, in India, when we do this, we may totally skip the hybrid option, directly leapfrog to a totally electric battery-powered vehicle. So that's my understanding of this question. But I didn't fully get it when you said hybrid and tracked and the military application. So I'm not sure. Thank you, sir. The next question. What are the challenges of developing hybrid tracked vehicles? Oh, I think it's a related question. So unless we understand what he means by hybrid and tracked, I wouldn't be able to justify my answer here. So I will take it offline by email maybe to understand what exactly he actually 
and by hybrid and track sorry thank you sir the next question is what are the plans of mahindra group for coming 5 to 10 years in electric vehicle so so far the initial approach was to convert existing vehicles into electric vehicles so if we have a say kuv we will make a e kuv so on but now we are looking at uh, basically born electric which is from scratch designing a fully optimized electric vehicle systems in the next 3 to 5 years you will see a lot of electric vehicles from mahindra especially in the compact suv category autonomous features and shared aspects everything would come together when we say electric sure thank you sir the next question is what are the kind of standards india should adopt and any india specific standards need to be developed um i'm not very knowledgeable on this um i need to talk to our own experts to see where we are in terms of standards and how indian standards would be different from the say the american standards or the european standards this is something i'm not very knowledgeable on right now ram would you like to answer this question so the areas like 5g where we have come up with india specific patterns but the more global standards we adopt the better it will be especially when we talk about charging points adapters like tesla having its own unique uh, charging points right that's becoming a deterrent for faster adoption of evs so yes standards interoperable standards are always good there is always a debate on india specific or whether we need to adopt global standards so like i said 5g there are some areas where we have our own patterns but the rest of it i think the more global it becomes the better but each company would want to have their own standards for competitive for advantage. example uh, tesla has filed lot of uh, patents around the core technologies which can become standards that's the reason why they have also opened and said that anybody can use these uh, patented technologies so that it becomes a mainstream standard for across electric vehicle industry so such very fundamental things are happening around the standards for electric autonomous and connected vehicles today yeah, yeah. ieee has come out with a set of standards ieee has come out with a unified standard for the electric uh, autonomous vehicles i think uh, they are taking the industries into their fold and then the uh, the consortium has come out with a set of standards i would also like to hear about it okay sir the next question what are the skill sets that one should develop in order to thrive in this mobility industry in future yeah so that i covered briefly in my uh, talk right we can broadly look at hard skills and soft skills and within hard skills the usual emerging technologies like right? ai ml programming languages for them those are the type of uh, skill sets i also showed you a snapshot of where the employment is heading where new jobs are getting created like marketing is one data analytics is one so in all of them uh, programming of them will be important but the like i said the programming language comes last first is a logic dr shankar explained several scenarios so how do you build a logic tree for it how realistic is it scenario analysis finally implementing it is the programming language part so very briefly we touched upon the type of uh, skill set that we did first one more important uh, skill set for example is when it was ic engine vehicle almost all our engineers were mechanical engineers today when we talk about electric autonomous connected and shared we need mechanical engineering skills electrical electronics and basic uh, computer programming too so each and every mobility engineer has to have all these skills for them to work on the development of any of these products that's a very big shift because it's not just working in a cross functional team but every person needs to have skills basic engineering skills in all these four domains so that's a requirement by 2030 we call it as mobility engineer 2030 and ram and i we have been writing a series of articles around this so there are going to be very fundamental shifts it's not just some soft skills there are core engineering skills which we need to expand and reskill ourselves for us to be relevant to the new mobility industry so you can does, it mean, does it mean a, a new discipline of engineering course will emerge absolutely many iits are actually working with us to create offer masters level programs some of them are online for working professionals to reskill themselves it's a whole new field where every person has to know bit of mechanical electrical electronics and computer science and what not so i will share some details with you i could uh, share it with all the audience because it's important for all of us to know but what is it we need to know 
by 2030 to be part of this big, big change that we are talking about. I think I so remember seeing an article written by you comparing the current syllabus and then what is expected for a mobility engineer. Yes. I think yes. That, that I think we can share it with the participants. Absolutely. There are four <laughs> more articles in that series. I will share all the complete set with you. Okay. And then the, the series of articles that Dr. Shankar mentioned, we wrote 14 or 15 articles in Motor Vigran. 16. 16, yeah. 16. yeah it, it was weekly in English and then in Tamil it came in the print version. So Monthly. those of you who are interested can check out those articles. Some of them and are available other than this, Those of you who have access to SAE, there is a journal called Mobility Engineering, which is brought out every quarter. So in each of this issue, I write an article four to five pages on Mobility Engineer 2030, where we go a little deeper into the various new technology skills that we need to build. So we will share all these resources with you. Thank you, sir. The next question, how the hyper-connectivity can be controlled in electrical connections through computer system? Can you, can you repeat? How the hyper-connectivity can be controlled in electrical connections through computer systems? I didn't uh, fully understand the question. Um, Hyper-connectivity. Basically, it's about the intersection of connectivity and electric vehicles. Okay. So that was one of the scenarios which Dr. Okay, Shankar I'm not at all knowledgeable on this. Okay, so we'll move to the next question. Sure. Sure. In electrical vehicle, how we can add both a fuel type and electrical type in one vehicle? In electrical vehicle, how we can? Fuel, fuel type and electrical oh, type. We're talking about a hybrid. And yes. that's where we'll basically have an engine which will run on a regular fuel, maybe a gasoline, say. And then there will be a battery and a motor. So when the battery runs out of charge, basically the engine will take over. Now as the engine runs and the vehicle moves, the battery also will get recharged. So the fuel is used for running the vehicle and also for recharging the battery. That's a typical hybrid vehicle configuration. And um, what I also mentioned was we may totally skip this hybrid vehicle and may leapfrog to a completely fully battery powered electric vehicle going forward, especially in India. Sure. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll move to the next question. What are the impacts of machine learning and data science in future of mobility? Very important. Most important. I'll just say a few things that I am aware of, then Ram will add to it. Um, we are using a lot of uh, machine learning, data analytics, uh, to improve the performance of our vehicles. Um, electric vehicles, connected and autonomous. In all these areas, we are actually using extensively. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have trained almost... Uh, more than 50% of our engineers across all groups in basic data science and analytics. Because in every domain, every single project that's happening at Mahindra, we are seeing how much data analytics can accelerate the development which are there in the field. By just analyzing it, we are able to predict so many failure modes. We are able to see some of the complicated interactions that we don't fully understand the physics. But just through data analysis, we are able to see the correlations and improve the performance of the vehicles very significantly. So uh, there's a, there's a big impact and a big opportunity to apply data science across all developments, across electric, autonomous, and connected vehicles, actually. So we are making sure that almost all our engineers are trained and have basic knowledge of machine learning and data analytics. Over the next couple of years, we wanted to aggressively make this happen. That's important. Thank you, sir. The last question. What are the challenges that an autonomous automotive sector, especially a commercial vehicle manufacturers, would face as the future mobility switches to electric and the integrated connectivity in terms of charging infrastructure and 4G, 5G infrastructure? So electric would make it easy for adoption of uh, autonomous because... Uh, making an IC engine vehicle autonomous is a lot more difficult, but making an electric and connected vehicle autonomous is much, much easier, actually. So that's going to greatly accelerate. I also mentioned that, for example, the LiDAR, which is the eye of the autonomous vehicle, 99% drop in the price. Also mentioned that one of the leaders in LiDAR is setting up an R&D center in India, and this is already happening, and they're actively hiring people to develop uh, systems which work best in Indian conditions. So all these things are happening. So the whole path to a vehicle which is autonomous, electric, connected, unshared is fairly clear. 
and the convergence can happen much earlier than what the experts predict today actually it's always happened much much faster than predicted so that will surely happen but as we said to get an autonomous vehicle on the road that could take some more time so we have to do it in a staged manner going through the five levels of autonomy in a very structured fashion but the price is systematically coming down because the technology is growing exponentially so the affordability won't be a big problem to worry about for the next five years but what is important is the sustainability which ram highlighted we need to make sure that the way we make these vehicles and you know, manufacture them and even the end of the life everything is done in a very sustainable manner so that the whole thing nearly very clearly enables a circular economy because we are just starting this whole electric uh, wave so better to think about sustainability at this early stage make sure everything that we do is aligned to creating a circular economy around the electric vehicles if we do this right we will be a global hub for electric vehicles the products that we make for indian markets can go ahead and sell in different other parts of the globe also that's a amazing opportunity that we have as a country when it comes to electric vehicles it's very important for us to do this right so dr shankar mr ananta padmanaban has a question 22000 charging stations are not enough which segment do you predict will be service first so the way i look at it long distance uh, travel trucks versus uh, urban mobility i think both will be completely two different segments when it comes to charging stations with an urban uh, setup i think the density of charging stations will be very important very closely required but when you look at long distance uh, passenger vehicles or even goods trucks they obviously need bulky trucks because for the equivalent of the horsepower and ic engine vehicle gives for an equivalent in battery vehicle obviously batteries have to be bulky so i think the two will probably play out as two different market segments so which one will be service first i think urban mobility will pick up first it's 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 a good question so i think bmw ceo was or uh, volvo trucks one of the ceos was talking about it about the challenge faced in trucks the so trucks are for finding vast adoption in countries like germany for city to city traffic so that you may not need too many dense charging stations because it's along the highway so i think urban charging stations will pick up fast dr shankar if you look at the fame policy uh, it uh, does talks about three stages first stage is basically the shared mobility providers like the olas and the ubers because they have uh, it's very attractive for them to switch to electric cars so they will create their own charging infrastructure make sure that it's very easy for their cars to access a charging point very quickly and get charged so that is they will do it because there is a lot of money in that so that will happen the stage 2 is public transportation the buses especially followed by the trucks that ram mentioned phase 3 is when you and i will actually make up our minds to switch over to electric car and by then the charging infrastructure would definitely be in place because each phase is roughly about 5 years at least so we are talking about uh, 15 years from now so where we can very comfortably use moreover look at this electric car will also be a connected car so suppose i am starting from chennai i want to go to bangalore which is 350 kilometers and my car has only 150 kilometer range i'll just tell my car i want to do 350 kilometers over the next 7 hours car will understand car will also know what are the charging points along the way the charging point is free at what time everything it will figure out and it will optimize my trip so that i when i take a coffee break or a lunch break the car also gets charged and need not get charged fully it will just charge sufficient enough for me to next reach the next charging station where i can do another 20% so all i need to do is the distance and the time it will optimize and plan my entire journey such a way that i can do 350 kilometers with a electric car that has a range of say only 100 or 150 kilometers that is still possible the car becomes smart and that's what will make it happen so we need not really worry too much about this uh, charging it will happen definitely so one question from mm-hmm. mr premnath interesting dr shankar yes. please come in on... just left i was waiting to answer the question okay. it just left so yeah. we'll also email him sure okay yeah comment on how public transportation will evolve i think public transportation is definitely going to uh, increase once the pandemic uh, subsides one interesting point of view i had was it could become multi modal so from for the last mile from your home to a metro station take a small e bike from that take a metro 
within the city you may use a shared uh, car or a taxi and come back home by metro and then the last mile again could be an e bike so multimodal is again an interesting absolutely concept. see you have electric buses in bangalore and we have electric trains in chennai so public transportation will greatly benefit when you switch to electric and as you say we need to definitely worry about the last mile connectivity also so the electric cycles and the electric scooters will play a very big role so multimodal is the way to go absolutely sure thank you sir these are the some of the questions from audience now i request uh, dr priya vijay chairman computer society of india chennai chapter to formally propose the vote of thanks over to thank you sir vijay. on behalf of ieee cs metros acm chennai and csi chennai chapter i took the opportunity to provide the vote of thanks i heartfully thank our speakers dr shankar venugopal and mr s ramachandran for their excellent and informative presentation i thank our associate professional society partners in arranging this excellent presentation i thank dr p sakthivel chair ieee cs madras and mr Met- hr mohan chair acm chennai for their uh, help and support throughout to us in arranging webinars i thank our event management team mr p v subramaniam immediate past chair and dr agila mc member for their continuous support from starting from invitation till end sending the video recording to all the participant i thank them i thank all the members past ob members present ob members past mc members present mem- mc members of all the three professional societies who have joined and supported us at last but not least i thank all the participants who enthusiastically joined the webinar and so much interactive in asking questions and taking the opportunity to attend this webinar and making it more success thank you all regarding the upcoming events we are conducting a symposium on intelligent and smart systems and the link has been given in the chat box and on 27th november we have the webinar ipv6 migration need issues and process the link is also provided in the chat box i request you all to take the opportunity to attend our upcoming webinars thank you all stay safe good night take care thank, thank you so you. much for the opportunity Ram, there is one question in the chat box. Can you just take it up? Yeah, yeah sure, sir. Sure. There is a uh, startup coming up in IIT Madras. Someone has asked the question. Gautam, on Gautam has asked. Ram, sir, told that in IIT Madras, one startup is working on automobile domain. How can I take part in that? The IIT Madras, one startup is working on automobile domain. Uh, ram i mentioned about a startup which is hmm. called the e plane which is uh, professor uh, satya chakravarti from the it madras and uh, there are two or three startups in that space and the one is called e plane which is basically a electric uh, aircraft it's a small aircraft maybe a four seater which is electric powered actually that is uh, one startup that i mentioned sometime during my talk um there are a few other startups especially around the electric bicycle battery space but i didn't mention that in my talk this is the only one that i mentioned this uh, subsidies on electric vehicle will it continue forever or what is going to be i think um, we did uh, some uh, study to understand the effect of subsidy and um, for example in china they saw that uh, when they pull out the subsidy immediately the demand for electric the sale also comes down so they said okay we'll extend the subsidy till 2022 and then 2025 whether it's going on but i think there is a optimum time you cannot have it forever so there is a optimum time uh, by when we have to systematically reduce the subsidy and by the time the when we make more vehicles the because of the scale uh economies of scale would kick in and then we'll be able to make these vehicles at a lower cost also hopefully there will be battery innovations which will make the battery also cheaper uh so 
uh, there is that would be optimum time. Then we should stop the subsidy. Maybe that could be five years or six years, depending on the country and the rate of development of technology out there. But uh, for now, subsidies would help. But uh, maybe five years would be a reasonable time for us to to cut. Uh, out of uh, two wheelers and four wheelers, which are running uh, on fuel, which will first disappear? <laughs> I think after the Ola factory comes up, I will stick yes. my neck out and say probably two wheelers yeah. will catch up faster in India. Two wheelers and three wheelers Even will play a very market. big role for Indian market. Correct. And if, for example, a company like Ola or anybody else comes in with the electric two wheeler, I think a lot of people would switch over very quickly. And for the kind of space available on the Indian roads, I think two wheelers, it's very important to make it. And Mahindra, we make electric three wheelers. It's called Trio. It's electric auto. And um, so two wheelers and three wheelers definitely will have very big impact. Sure. But unfortunately, not much of investment is going on in this uh, this segment, you know. True, true. Is it is it uh, manufacturers are looking more in terms of uh, making uh, four wheelers and other uh, high value items rather than uh, low cost items, right? Is it something mm. like that? No, really. We will see in the next couple of years. We will see more players in the two wheelers. Definitely, yes. And we have already started our journey on three wheelers. So the slowly we are expanding to different states. The policies are also getting in place. Because sometimes policy also can be a problem to switch over to electric autos. So that is happening now. Two wheelers will okay. definitely happen. In the next two years, you will see a lot more players. What type of driving test will be required for these EVs? Like RTOs, what type of driving test they will uh, administer? Electric vehicle, I don't know how different it will be when it comes to driving. Basically, it's uh, instantaneous acceleration. So you can reach uh, higher speeds much, much faster than in the engine vehicle. So that is one thing you need to take care of. And uh, it uh, hardly makes any noise. So especially for the pedestrian, he may not know if there is a car coming behind him. So beyond these two, I don't see anything fundamentally different. Uh, in terms of driving, yeah, electric vehicle versus uh, IC engine vehicle. No, no, no. So, Basically, my question my question is not the difference, but testing. how these uh, RTOs, regional testing officers, not transport officers, they issue the driving license. Correct. Will there be any any change in the way they administer the test to give the driving license? Uh, honestly, I don't know, sir. I haven't I, thought about it. I don't think so, sir. I think it is a test of maneuverability, right? Not about how good are you in operating the vehicle? In fact, there was one joke uh, on WhatsApp, right? After all these heavy rains in Bangalore, Chennai, with so many potholes filled with water, somebody said, now you know why the RTO asks you to, uh, you know, make an eight and show you, right? So yes. yeah, it's about zigzag <laughs> driving. So it's yeah. about maneuverability without uh, losing balance, making sure you follow the uh, rules of the land, right? That's what they basically test. It's not about how well you operate the vehicle. They don't care about fuel efficiency, you need to follow the speed limit, follow signals, and can you are you good in maneuvering the road depending on the traffic? Right? What I was uh, trying to say yeah. is with yeah. electric, you may be tempted to drive at faster speeds because it's uh, it's so easy to accelerate instantaneously and pick up how good a driver you are in controlling the speed of the vehicle. Those kind of things can possibly happen, but I haven't really no, yeah. thought about it. Yeah, so. yeah, because. Uh, Many things are not in the control of the driver, the sure. person who is going to drive. Yes. So, yes. which means that uh, uh, how well you know he will be equipped, or how we are going to really test is maybe you know some psychological factors also will have to come into being. Correct. Yeah. How <laughs> well, for person... example, since it's very quiet inside the car, there is no engine noise, nothing. So the driver has to be super alert, actually. Uh, So thank you, sir. Thank Thanks you, a excellent lot, sir, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank you. We sir. really enjoyed putting together this presentation and such a good Q and A session. We thoroughly enjoyed think, this interaction. I think we, we need to take up a, a slightly a different uh, uh, session, wherein you know how to convert our uh, current engineers into mobi mobility engineers. You know, That's more focusing important. in terms sure. of uh, curriculum and then what one needs to uh, learn and uh, how the uh, uh, jobbing scenario will change. So these are the items, you know, putting together, maybe, you know, we can make one uh, uh, 
yes. uh, one future program so sure. that will be that will be a really good one it will directly address the uh, current uh, current students as well as the people you know who are in the automobile industry you know absolutely so that they can do the upskilling like upskilling is becoming very important so they can get future ready in another 5 years you know they will be continuously employed otherwise there could be some disruption in their uh, employment definitely definitely so we can we can work out a uh, i mean outline and then possibly yes. look at maybe in another few months time you know, so sure. that we can be most happy we do lot of these yeah. workshops so we'll be very yeah. happy to do it sure yeah and also uh, i think you know the additional information whatever your articles you are writing and then yes. of course i i have the compilation of the links of uh, motor vehicle articles so we can share with the participants you know so that they can in fact the motor vehicle articles are uh, more like storytelling what uh, yes. uh, ram was mentioning you know one of the minimum skill now required is uh, storytelling i really enjoy the way you know the technologies are brought in in the form of a story i yes. i vividly remember one of our uh, uh, business line uh, reporting and editor you know murli used to write on swatika the ending with ca you know this is our accounting you know how uh, accounting knowledge you know he used to transfer in the form of a story the the column was called swatika Oh. ending with uh, ca ca got it uh, so, uh, i mean it's just i was uh, i was able to compare these uh, series you know what you both you are writing in the motor vehicle and something similar because there I is uh, so much are, to yeah. learn in terms of new technology and there is very little time to quickly yeah. learn all these things so i remember there was a similar situation when a king had three sons who are not very intelligent when he approached the ministers they said it will take 12 years to educate them and since they are not intelligent it will take 20 years for them to absorb everything then but he said that's not feasible then one person came up with a way said i will make them intelligent in 6 months and uh, that's how the panchatantra was born actually vishnu sarma mm-hmm. said i i will teach them in 6 months and make them wise enough to become rulers and all that he achieved only through stories nothing else so i think uh, gamification storytelling all these things have great potential in terms of making it easy for people to learn something new yes sir so thank you thank you very much for uh, getting connected with us from a remote place <laughs> I mean, though though coimbatore is not a remote place the institution is at a slightly <laughs> different location so obviously you know, so so luckily connectivity cooperated couple of times it went off but it came back yeah. very quickly sorry about okay. that yeah that's okay other is fine So thank you thank you Ram. Thank, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. I look forward to working thank with you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Sir. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. So so things went up well. So the 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 very good sir. Here. Very, yeah, very good easy. thing that good thing that we could get that uh, slides in advance, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. And more than fifty.